Good morning, Brand DIYers. It is Mark here on a sunny, beautiful day in Victoria. It is Monday, feeling all enthusiastic and excited about getting started for the week again. And uh, I've got a great topic for you today. And you know what? Uh, shout out to Mark DeSoma. Uh, I believe Mark DeSoma is a brand strategist who lives in Toronto. But um, I went out looking a few weeks ago for interesting topics that I could bring to Brand DIY. And Mark DeSoma's name, who I will uh, credit in the show notes, came up again and again. And this dude is the mother load of interesting marketing and brand stories. And I looked at his, his uh, library of stories and I went, oh man, I could, I could learn from everything in here. So I'm going to share uh, in the future. I'm going to be bookmarking Mark DeSoma and checking out his stuff because uh, like all the great books that I, I learned from and I tapped in order to come up with topics for these um, live streams, he's got some really good stuff. So check him out. Anyways, the topic that I wanted to talk about today is how to create a more valuable brand. Uh, now, that is not the same as selling more stuff because you can sell more stuff by knocking your prices down. And that does not create a more valuable brand. In fact, it actually devalues your brand. Uh, a more valuable brand means a brand that is more sought after, that people are willing to pay more for, that is more coveted, things like that. Um, and there are a whole whack of ways that you can do it. And I just thought, you know, you probably have a lot of these tips and tricks already embedded in you because they are common sense. However, uh, there are things that you should just reflect on and go, hey, maybe I could try this. Maybe I should push more that way. And, you know, coming out of COVID now, it's especially relevant, especially uh, the first thing that I'm going to be talking about is entirely relevant to COVID. First tip for creating a more valuable brand. Number one, think about COVID. Be part of a rising category. Coming out of COVID, some categories are absolutely tanking. Airlines, cruise ships, restaurants, commercial real estate. And some categories are going through the roof. Remote work, home improvement, personal real estate. I don't know about you, but personally, I am finding uh, myself busier than ever coming out of COVID. I don't know if that's a rising tide that floats all boats or Lord knows what, but um, it seems like that there's a lot of enthusiasm and uh, it, it, it's very exciting, but the future is not evenly distributed. There are some categories that suck right now. So simple truth. Uh, if you have a product or a service or a brand, that product or service or brand, if it's not doing well right now, it is probably, remember Kevin Bacon, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, your product, service or brand is probably only one degree removed from a category that is doing extremely well right now. So what would it take for you to pull back and go, you know, things aren't going as well as they should. I wonder, looking around, those guys are doing good, those guys are doing good, those guys are doing good. Would it be possible for me to introduce a product or service that lines up with that thriving category and perhaps reinvent myself or evolve myself and hitch my wagon to that star? Second thing to create a more valuable brand, tackle social issues. Now, I talked about this last week. I talked about uh, brand and reputation being two different things. On the one hand, brand is about being relevant to your consumer and being differentiated from the competition. And that's all well and good. That's over here. However, if you don't have reputation, which is all about legitimacy, people will not buy your product. They'll say, yeah, I like that product. It is relevant to me and it does look different from the competition, but the company, I don't know. They kind of suck. They're not good guys. I'm not going to buy from them. It happens all the time. So how can you create legitimacy, a better reputation? One of the core ways is to tackle social issues. And this comes down to a very fundamental human truth, which is you have to show the world that you're about more than just trying to make money. Now, I'm not saying 
that you should look around and tackle one of the social issues that are super hot today. Diversity, Black Lives Matter, uh, education, uh, digital equity, where everybody has the same access to digital uh, products, uh, hunger, homelessness, although all of those things definitely could use your attention. What I am suggesting more is that you say, what does my brand stand for? What do we do? And how can we link that to a sense of purpose, a sense of serving the greater good? For example, you make solar lights, as one of my clients does. You make solar lights for outdoor lighting, uh, street lights, sidewalk lights, things like that. Now, could you serve the greater good by creating a program where you donate a certain number of lights to downtown core where things are not safe at night and the city has not installed new lighting. Just a thought. You don't have to take on diverse causes. Try to find something that's close to where you live and not metaphorically close to where your brand lives, that is, and, and, and adopt something like that. Be part of a rising category, tackle social issues. Third one, I love this. This is totally, totally clever. I, I, you, you live this every day, but it takes somebody like Mark DeSama to remind you. Increase share of life. Now, we all learn about share of market when we're doing Marketing 101 or Brand 101. And share of market means if there are 100 people out there who might be interested in your product, how many of them can you realistically get as your customers? That's share of market. Share of life is different. If you have a product that somebody uses at a very specific time of day, say, let's say you've got a chocolate snack that people have in the afternoon just to get them over the 2 p.m. bump. You have a chocolate snack that people use for that. Well, could you introduce another snack that people use in the mornings to get them going in the day? Something a little more protein, uh, a little more, um, um, uh, a little less sugar in it, something that gets people started in their day, or could you create a chocolate snack that is for special going out occasions uh, so that people would not just have your snack in the afternoon, but they would have a version of your snack to bring along for company when they go out and see people. You can plant yourself uh, into different areas of their life as a brand and become more ubiquitous. Now, Apple is brilliant at this. Apple not only uh, owns uh, your computer and, and your business and work, but they also own your music. And for a long time, they owned your photography and they own your phone. They own a whole bunch of different things. Wherever your life goes, there's probably an Apple product for it. And what does that mean? That if you build up trust in Apple for one thing, then it's easier to buy another thing with the Apple logo on it. And the more Apple things you buy for the different parts of your life, the more valuable the brand. There you go. So we've got be part of a rising category, tackle social issues, increase share of life, be more convenient. Remember that rule, how many clicks on your website to get to purchase? Well, think about that in the context of everything that you do. How many times does the phone ring before somebody picks it up at your office? Uh, how many days do folks have to wait before your package arrives in the mail? It's, it's, uh, it's the little things that matter, but we are working in a world where convenience rules. So and analyze everything about the relationship with you. How easy is it to work with you? And the most important question, it doesn't need to be the easy you don't need to be absolutely easy to work with. You only need to be easier than the competition to work with. All right, so be part of a rising category, tackle social issues, increase share of life, be more convenient, beautify. Now, this goes back to Malcolm Gladwell and Blink. Uh, when we see things, whether it is valid or noble or not, but we form an instant reaction. That can be seeing a person going, I don't trust that person, or I wanna be like that person. It can be a product where you go, ah, not for me. What is it? I don't even know. It's just not for me. Or that one, oh, I love that. What is that? I don't know, but I love it. Beautify, we live in a visual world. Take a look at your website. Take a look at your packaging. 
Take a look at your collateral. Hold it up. Is it beautiful? Is it cool? Is it classy? Does it catch your eye? Or does it look like it was done on a photocopier in the 1970s? These are the sort of things that we do not pay attention to, especially when our business is going well. But it pays to pull back every once in a while and say, huh, is that as beautiful, cool, classy, easy to read, attractive, blink reaction getting as it could be? It's a constant thing, but the more you pay attention to the aesthetic, the more valuable your brand will become. Final tip, break the boring. Do you remember when Patagonia did that ad in the New York Times a few years ago and it said, don't buy this jacket? Uh, it was the shot that was heard around the world. What? These guys are telling me not to buy their clothing? Are they nuts? It was all about wearing their clothing for a good long time. Don't buy their stuff just because you want to buy stuff. Think about the world. Now, this is also tackling social issues, but it was just such a slap in the face when it comes to advertising because most of us go buy, buy, buy. They said, don't buy. They broke the boring. The consumers today have incredible ad filtering tools. You need their permission to give them your message. They don't have to look at your message. They can skip right past it anytime, any way. So ask yourself, if you saw your ad as a consumer, would you give permission to the company and say, you know what, I'll look at that? Or would you just skim over it? That's the old question. It was a, it's a cliche that we used to use when we were working with big brands. We said, as a consumer, would you love this ad? And we always used it when we had radical risky advertising. We showed it to our product managers and they said, oh, I love that. They said, and we said, as a consumer, you love it. As a brand manager, would you buy it? Oh no, I could never buy it. That's too radical for us. Well, think about that. Inside of your brain, there are already, uh, there's already a conflict between you, the human, and you, the brand manager. It's time to think more like you, the human. If it's appealing, if it's cool, if it's great, that's probably the way to go. Being risk averse means you're one step closer to boring, which means you're one step closer to a less valuable brand. So there you go. That's what I got to talk about today. Thanks again to Mark Desama, a wealth of information from this guy. I'm going to be tapping him for more and more interesting uh, stories for brand DIY. And again, uh, how to make your brand more valuable, be part of a rising category, tackle social issues, increase share of life, be more convenient, beautify, break the boring. Oh, did you notice? Those are six. I just gave you an extra one. That's a way to make your brand more valuable too. I just gave you a little added value. Take care, have a great day, and let's build some valuable brands out there. See ya.